Um, so I, I'm really excited to be here, and I thought I would start just by being completely open. Um, when I got this email from the OpenViz organizers saying, congratulations, your talk has been accepted, um, I was just, I, you know, I was really excited. This is like where all the cool kids come and hang out. Until that wasn't that they published the, the program, and I saw that, yes, in fact, I'm the boring academic that has to go after the disagreements from the New York Times. So, um, yes, that, that's, you know, thank you, really. <laughs> uh, so so when, I, when I put my proposal together for uh, this talk, um, I had just recently, as Arvind mentioned, had a book published from O'Reilly that I co-authored with um, Danielle Fisher. And I first thought, okay, well, I should talk about the book, right? People tell me you need to promote this book. But um, honestly, I, you know, I have to say, I think there's a lot of things in the book that for most people in this room, probably not that interesting. I'm told that's not exactly how you self-promote. But um, I, I thought, well, maybe if I show a tweet from the conference, where they promoted my book, that's not obnoxious self-promoting, right? <laughs> so as it, as it turns out, though, honestly, um, I, I, I don't want to talk to you about the book, but I do want to talk to you about a couple of the ideas that my colleague Danielle and I um, worked on that we just happened to be talking about in our book. Um, and specifically, I want to talk to you about some of these ideas um, that we've been thinking about and developing for how to provide some structure to what we think are some of the, the really messy and um, uh, parts of the design process that a lot of people don't talk about. Um, and that specifically is about how do you um, figure out what it is that you're actually designing your visualization to support. Um, and so I'm going to talk about these ideas, and then I also want to talk about what I think are some implications of that perspective on what we do as visualization designers. And so that's roughly how this talk will go. Um, a little bit of academic theory in the beginning, yes, the boring part. Um, a couple of projects I've worked on to try to ground some of those ideas, and then a little bit of soapbox speculation at the end. But before we go on, um, I wanted to put up this picture because I've been really surprised in some of my conversations with people last night and here today that a lot of people don't know anything about Salt Lake City in Utah, and that is this gorgeous place in the mountains. Um, this is the campus that I work on, and this is roughly where my office is. Um, it's a really amazing place to live and work. And at the University of Utah, um, my visualization practice really focuses on designing for experts. Um, and so uh, the, the collaborations that I, that I have usually sort of start something like this, where there'll be um, a visualization person and then some sort of scientist, and they say, or I say, so what is it that you want to visualize? And they'll come back and say something like, well, from patterns of conservation, we want to visualize the mechanisms that influence gene regulation. And to me, it usually sounds something like this. So, so, you know, I, I, I put this up here like this, you know, sort of in a joking way, but to be honest, that isn't so far from, from how the projects I work on really start and how they sort of feel. Um, and as a researcher, what I'm really interested in is how we go from something like this to an effective visualization design that actually supports people in answering the questions that they want to answer. In my research group, uh, we really focus on trying to develop and articulate structured process um, or, or uh, mechanisms for guiding this design process. Um, and we do this by reflecting on our own experiences of going off and designing visualizations for people in the world. And so, I'll, I'll, as I said, I'll talk about a couple of those projects later in this talk. Um, but specifically, the part I want to I want to focus on right now is this early stage where we, as visualization designers, have to go out and understand um, exactly what it is that we're designing for. And so, personally, I find this part of the process the most fun, but also the most challenging. Um, so, the, the 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 sorts of techniques that we throw at this part of the process um, are techniques that I th I'm guessing many people in this room are familiar with. Um, we do things like we go off and we do a lot of interviews and contextual inquiry um, to, to learn more about um, a domain and about how people think about their data. 
We also just dig into the data ourselves, doing a lot of exploratory data analysis to get a sense of what's in there. Um, and then we really embrace the notion of rapid prototyping because we want to get our worst ideas out as fast as we can, um, but also because we like to use our visualizations as a probe to understand how people um, um, are thinking about their, their problems. And so the main point, um, or, and so you know, I've started to come to, to calling this part of the process um, data counseling. Because it's not so different than going to a therapist where after uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of conversations, you find out that your problems are really deep-seated things about your parents, or I don't know, maybe that's just me. Um, but, but you know, I think as viz, viz designers, a lot of times we also serve this role where what we have to do is help people articulate the things that they really need to understand about their data and things they often can't articulate themselves up front. Um, and Amanda and Kevin, I have some time later if you two need some counseling help. But the, the, the main point of data counseling is really to unpack statements like this one um, into uh, something that we as visualization designers can actually design a tool to support. So how do we go about mapping from some sort of very semantically rich domain specific goal into a very data specific one. And I think the, the, the key idea here is around this notion of identifying good proxies. And so by a proxy, what I mean is, these are the, uh, the partial and imperfect data representations of that semantically rich statement, um, uh, of the semantically rich thing that the analyst really is interested in. Um, and so the high level goals of analysts and you know, of, of the people that, that I work with are actually rarely captured directly in the data that we have at hand. And in fact, um, they often don't have data attributes that directly reference the thing they care about. And if they did, I'd argue you probably don't need visualization anyway. Um, instead, as visualization designers, we have to really understand the goals of those analysts and find effective approximations for those things in the data. Um, I'm going to walk through a really simple example of this with, with this um, oh, beautifully uh, semantically rich um, problem in the world, which is identifying good film directors. But let's say that I was a, I was a film student and um, I wanted to do a research project to sort of understand, you know, who are good film directors out there. Um, and let's say maybe what I've done is I've gone off and scraped a bunch of data from IMDb about movies. Um, and so this data, this data contains a lot of information about movies, such as their ratings, how much money they brought in, and information about who directed them. Now, I can't actually directly answer uh, this question using the data that I have. And so what I need to do is identify some reasonable proxies that will then let me infer something about the thing I really care about. And so this is a part of um, what Dan, um, Danielle and I have written about in our book, um, which is a simple framework for how do we go about uh, identifying good proxies. And so we, we propose this idea of thinking about our task in terms of a number of components. So first is the action component, which is the thing you want to do. Then there is the object component, which is the thing you want to take that action on. And then finally, there's the measure, which is the value that you're actually interested in for those objects. And so if we apply this to our, um, our example, our action here is identify. And what is it we want to identify? Well, we want to identify film directors. Now it turns out my data set that I have is about movies, not directors. And so movie is gonna be my proxy here because if I can learn something about movies, then I, have a, I, have, um, I hope that I can then infer something about directors from those. Now what is it that I wanna know about movies? I wanna know if they're good. And this is where things, I, start, I think, start to get really interesting. Well, what does good mean here? It, you know, is a good director someone who's directed lots of films, or someone who's directed lots of films with high ratings, or made a lot of money? Um, and a lot of times when we think about identifying proxies, we have to think about them from multiple perspectives, or they're going to be different depending upon the goals of the person who's actually trying to um, answer this question. And so in this case, I'm going to say, well, for now, I'm going to consider good to be movies that have high IMDb ratings. Now, this is once we get these initial proxies, this is where we can really start digging in and further refining them. Um, maybe I care about movies with high ratings, but from many, many people, as opposed to the movies with the highest ratings, but just from a few. Um, um, and so we can explore these types of questions using visualizations to validate and refine our proxies. Now, this process of doing so is very iterative, and it's indirect. 
And at the end, we really build up insight through going through and exploring multiple layers of proxies along the way. Okay, so, but as I'm sure people in here know, like, you know, designing really effective visualizations, it's not just about finding good proxies, um, it's also about, you know, finding good effective representations um, of those proxies to understand them. Um, oh. Gosh, sorry, one buildup I forgot. Uh, <laughs> so, right, so, so the idea is with these proxies, we can go through and then create tasks that we can actually design for. Okay, so, so speaking of, of designing good, effective representations of proxies, um, th uh, that was sort of the core focus of one of the projects that I worked on with a biology lab who study yeast. Um, so the scientific goals of this lab is that they really are interested in understanding how genes and genes functions um, evolve over time. And this sort of knowledge has a lot of implications for how we study diseases like cancer. So to address this goal, the lab is collecting um, information or, or data from um, a, whole, a handful of uh, spe uh, species of yeast that are related. Um, and they're, what they're doing is they're collecting information about which genes are turned on and off in the, the species under different experimental conditions. And we refer to this kind of data as gene expression. So in this regard, the lab is really interested in studying gene evolution, but that's actually not a concept that you can design an experiment to directly measure. So their proxy here is gene expression. Now it turns out for people who do study evolution, gene expression is just one type of proxy you can use to study that. And there's many scientific labs that will take a different kind of um, lens for how to, how to probe the notion of, of evolution. Because at the end of the day, data itself is just a proxy for, for the world and the things that we care about. And a large part of data-driven science today is actually about figuring out um, what kinds of measurements are good proxies for the things that we really care about and want to understand. So this specific biology lab was collecting uh, gene expression measurements over time and in multiple species. And when I began working with them, um, they were really struggling to make sense of this data that they had painstakingly captured for years using conventional visualization techniques. So I, I collaborated with this lab for about a year, and I also um, got to work with a really brilliant designer, Bang Wong, who specializes in scientific communication. So Bang and I designed a new tool I'm showing you here called Pathline. And um, one of the, the um, advances of Pathline was how we ended up visually representing that gene expression information. So traditionally, scientists will use a visualization like a heat map um, to show gene expression. Open any biology journal and flip through it, you will see heat maps, I can promise you. Um, and this is actually a heat map showing some of the data from this specific lab. So in this view, um, the genes are going across the columns and uh, the, the rows are time and then species. And the lab members, when I talked to them, um, they found that these heat maps were really difficult to make sense of, particularly for reason, reasoning about the, the very small scale type of temporal patterns that they were interested in understanding. So Bang and I de um, developed a new way to look at this data that we called a curve map that replaced that color encoding with a matrix of time curves. Now to validate this, um, this new encoding, the group looked at three genes that they knew a lot about biologically. Um, genes five, six, and seven. Um, and this is where those genes are in that heat map display. Um, so for example, one of the things they knew um, was that for gene five, um, that it behaves very differently in these different species, which you can see by scanning down and seeing that the curves look very different for the different species. This is in contrast to gene seven, which is a gene that they knew behaved quite similarly across the species. And again, you can see it um, here in the, in the curve map. Um, so uh, another thing that they, that they knew was that the pairwise, um, that gene five and gene six actually perform similar functions in cells. Um, and so, uh, and you can see this by seeing as you go down, um, down the columns that these pairwise curves are quite similar. Now, both of these in insights were things that they um, knew about their data and helped to validate this new encoding that we threw at them. And they said that these trends were nearly impossible for them to pick out in that heat map display. But then they actually saw something that they had never seen before. And that was the relationship for this specific species for these two genes. They had no idea that it was actually an inverse relationship. And this was something that they had never been able to see in the, um, the heat map. 
So what this prompted them to do, they had no idea why this was. It went against what they had expected. And so they went back and designed new experiments in the lab and discovered a previously unknown gene duplication event in the ancient history of this specific species. So reflecting on this result you know, several years later, what I think is really interesting here is the role that visualization played for the members of this lab and the data itself which is that it was not a source of answers for them, but really it was a source of inspiration and brainstorming within their larger discovery pipeline. Now, I think that this, this role of visualization as a brainstorming tool was really taken to the extreme in another project I had in the digital humanities. Um, in this project, I was collaborating with a couple of poetry scholars who early on posed this question. How might a visualization affect the aesthetic experience of a close reading of a poem? I had no idea what this meant. It took about a year and a half of data counseling just to even begin to unpack what they meant by this. Um, luckily, in that time, I had a really talented student, Nina McCurdy, join my group. Um, and she somehow, she, she like mind melded with the, the poets um, and was able to really um, uh, understand, you know, you know, what are reasonable proxies for, for how we go about thinking about this problem. What we learned was that poets really weave together a wide range of poetic devices when writing a poem in order to be able to influence and shape the um, emotional experience that someone has when they read that poem. Our collaborators were really interested in visualizing these different devices in the context of a poem. It turns out that some of these devices on here, for example, metaphor, things that are open computer science problems, if you could actually detect in text. Um, but there was, one in, there was one device in particular that caught our eye as being both computationally um, uh, feasible as well as poetically uh, um, rich, and that is the notion of rhyme. Now, by rhyme, I don't just mean um, cat, bat, sat. Um, poets think of rhyme in a much more broader way. It's really about um, things that have some sort of sonic relationship to them. So we ended up developing an NLP backend to be able to detect sets of words that are related through these different kinds of sonic patterns. And these patterns are very broad. They range a, a very broad range of types of sonic patterns. Um, and we developed a very general backend to be able to support doing that. Um, we then visualized sets of words that were related from these patterns um, in the space of the poem, which was important for our collaborators. Um, and in doing so, we also attempted to capture this feeling of flow that the poets kept using as, when they described the evolution of sound within a poem. And so it was really this intersection and the divergence of the different flows that became the primary focus of our design for them. So we implemented these ideas in a tool called Poemage. Sorry, the, the resolution is a little funny here. Um, so we, yeah, in a tool called Poemage. Um, and this tool allowed the poets to very freely explore different rhyme sets for a very broad range of sonic patterns. And we were extremely careful, very dutiful visualization designers to create mechanisms that would uh, mitigate visual clutter. Um, and we used multiple views in order to support them in being able to look at uh, the, the sound, the sonic patterns from multiple different perspectives on the data. So we deployed Pomage to our poetry collaborators and we followed up a little while later to see what insights it generated for them. One poet uh, used the tool to create something called erasure poems, which are a form of poetry that are ge that's generated by erasing words from an existing text, resulting in a new poem and potentially new meaning. Um, she used different features of, of our tool to select and erase sets of words from a poem, and she was really guided by her own aesthetic um, sensibilities. And images of her erasure poems, two of which I'm showing you here, um, were then later displayed at an exhibit at a local art, art gallery. In another case study, um, a poet used Pomage to explore this poem called Reading Plato. And she described her approach to us um, as noodling, um, which was where she would hover over sonic features, um, one after another in the various views of the tool, selecting and deselecting different sets of, of words, um, almost arbitrarily. And she said that her greatest uh, successes and insights came in every case when she happened on something indirectly just through her idle play with the tool. And she reflected on her experience with the tool in this way. The interface felt engaging and responsive, and it reflects the sensibility that I experience when reading a poem. 
that interpretive readings are made, choice by responsive choice, and that nothing is absolutely conclusive. So what I actually really love about this quote um, is that it emphasizes both the iterative nature of her interpretive um, um, process, as well as the lack of a perfect, precise answer in the data for the things she cared about. And while it is the inherent nature of close reading of poetry to interpret and to be creative, um, I, find, I found that this, this experience of how they use this tool wasn't all that different from the way that scientists have used some of the other tools I designed for them as well. Um, so it turns out that none of our poetry collaborator, collaborators actually used our tool to carefully analyze patterns of sound within a poem. Um, the tool and the data were used as inspiration to support their creativity. And so later on, Nina and I were reflecting and we asked ourselves, well, could we just have looked at any device? Would it have produced just as much insight? What if we had actually just given them random sets of words? Would that have been as productive for them? What if we had actually designed Pomage to support creativity as opposed to being a data analysis interface? How might our designs have changed? And so when designing tools for experts, we assume that it's important to give people visualizations that support very accurate interpretations of exact values. We develop techniques that reduce time and errors um, in judgments so that an analyst can be precise and come up with an objective answer. But that is often not the role, at least in my own experience, that visualization tends to play in the discovery process of many different analysts. Furthermore, I think that this focus um, on accurate interpretations of values makes a really another significant assumption. And that assumption is that the data itself is an accurate representation of the world. Which brings me to um, a recent project that we worked on in, with global health experts who are working to understand um, the, uh, the, the spread and effects of the Zika virus and its associated health risks, um, most notably microcephaly in babies who are infected in utero. So this is another project that was headed up by my student, Nina. Um, and she began this project with a six-month field study at a US uh, government agency, not to be named, um, that specializes in uh, global health. So when we started working on this project, um, yeah, politics aside here. Um, when we started working on this project, it had all the signs of being a really straightforward visualization design project. Um, the experts we worked with had data, or they roughly knew where to get it. Um, they had already been trying to use visualization in their workflow and been failing. And most importantly, they were super excited to work with us and spend time on, on um, moving towards some innovative visualizations. Now, during this field study, uh, Nina developed and deployed a prototype tool to explore Zika outbreak data along with data about in-country programs that international organizations have in place to combat the disease. And the goal of the tool was to help these global health experts make decisions about whether or not to move or expand different programs in different parts of, um, of the world um, in, as they projected the status of what they thought the Zika virus outbreak was gonna do. We ended up evaluating this tool in a variety of different ways, and in all levels, we got positive feedback from different kinds of stakeholders. That the, that the design wasn't, in fact, an effective representation of the data that they had. And yet, uh, we noticed a hesitation by the people we were working with to actually incorporate this tool as part of their workflow. Um, and so we probed this reluctance, and we were really um, interested to find out that even though our tool was a good reflection of the data that they had, the data that they had was not a good reflection of what the experts knew to be true about the spread of Zika on the ground. So this first came up um, in a discussion that we had around a core pleth showing Zika case data at the national level. Now here, Brazil was shown in dark red, indicating that it had a relatively high percentage of cases, as opposed to Colombia, which was in a lighter orange, indicating that it had a, a lower percentage. And in discussing these maps, one of our collaborators um, noted to us that while Brazil reports all cases, Colombia runs a full investigation um, before making any reports. So the implication here is that um, the, the difference in how these countries are reporting on, Zika, on their Zika cases resulted in aggregated data that presents an inaccurate and possibly misleading picture of what's actually going on. 
So we got really interested this, in this and pivoted in our project to focus on this. And what we discovered was really it was the distributed heterogeneous nature of generating and aggregating this, this public health data about the outbreak across multiple countries and within those countries that was resulting in inherently erroneous data. But even though the data didn't contain um, or didn't reflect these errors, the experts on the team had a wealth of information that they knew um, about their existence, the impact, and the source of the problems that they saw. And they viewed this data through the lens of this knowledge and contextualized um, what they saw in terms of what they knew. So as one of our collaborators candidly put it, using the visualization tool required suspending disbelief around the quality, consistency, and availability of the data. So this led us to rethink the role of visualization um, for our collaborators. We decided to focus on developing mechanisms to support them in externalizing their implicit knowledge about the errors in the data, which we then incorporated directly back into the data visualization itself. And the goal of this externalization was to, to support more effective data analysis, to be able to allow experts to transfer knowledge between themselves, also to serve as institutional memory of what the experts knew. Um, now, the idea that data is plagued with inaccuracies and missing um, important contextual details is not unique to, the, to global health. Um, I've worked with meteorologists who report really not, um, they report uh, suspicions about certain kinds of weather simulations under certain conditions. I've worked with biologists who mentally adjust what they see based upon problems they know about different kinds of experimental techniques. And I've also worked with air quality experts who literally calibrate sensor data in their heads based upon the types of, of techniques that a specific sensor might use to make the measurement. Experts do this all the time. It turns out non-experts, aka the general public, also do this, particularly when we're interpreting um, personally relevant data, but in that case we often refer to it as bias. So here is the pitch I want to make to you. Data is only a proxy for the world, and sometimes it's a very inaccurate one. But all is not lost, because it turns out that a lot of times we have a lot of knowledge about these inaccuracies in our head. Two, visualization in supports interpretation of these proxies. It is a thinking tool that helps us to find good proxies and to make inferences based on them. And three, but at the end of the day, insights really come from our own experience and our knowledge not from answers that we discover in the data. So, so, so what, what might that pitch mean for, for visualization design? Um, well, first, I really think that we need to find ways to capture the discovery process that an analyst goes through um, and to, to externalize the reasoning that we have as we explore data. Um, this is where insight happens. Um, and this is where our insight evolves from, from getting in and playing with the data. Um, a visual, as visualization designers, I think we spend a lot of time focusing on the visual representation itself and not enough of thinking about the sequence of steps and discoveries that an analyst makes along the way. How can we go about supporting um, to, to capture as well as to communicate that full um, exploration and analysis uh, workflow? And then second, I also think that um, as, as we, you know, rethinking sometimes even how we visualize the data itself and what our goals are as visualization designers. So if you take this perspective that data is only a proxy for the world and that visualization is really a thinking tool to help us brainstorm around those proxies, what might that mean for the way that we design our tools? Um, how might we change the, the types of things that we, we want to communicate to people? Um, and so I, I don't personally have any answers to these questions, but um, I, I know there's a lot of really smart, really creative, really innovative people in this room who just might. Um, and I just sort of want to pose the question that if we shift our perspective a little bit on data and visualization, how might we, what might we come up with? Um, and so with that, I just want to um, thank the, the amazing people that I get to work with every day at the University of Utah at the, at the Visualization Design Lab. Um, and thank all of you for your attention.